A few months ago, I attended an event down here in Orlando, Florida. And in the event, it was all about startups and founders had a whole slew of startups from space to regular, you know, technology startups. They interviewed all the different companies about what they're trying to accomplish and what they've already accomplished up till now. I was really interested in who this company was that was put on this event. And the company's name is called Florida Venture Forum. It's actually an organization of members that are startup founders, uh, angel investors, venture capitals, uh, and other financial uh, institutions that provide funding for startups and new business ideas, even space related ideas. Well, I got to meet the president of the organization. His name is Kevin Burgoyne. And I asked him to be part of my podcast, showed up on our podcast, and we interviewed him and we had a great episode. And in this specific episode, if you're interested in venture funding, you're interested in angel investing, you're interested in, in having a startup and trying to get funding, this is the episode you want to listen to. Let's get started with this episode. This is Kevin Burgoyne, president of Florida Venture Forum. This is the Build With Tech podcast, where we dive into the minds of business leaders, building tech-enabled businesses to launch and scale profitable enterprises. With your host, Ray Ortega. Hey everyone, this is the Build With Tech podcast and I have a special guest today that I'm really excited about. His name is Kevin Burgoyne. Um, if you haven't known who he is, he is the CEO of Florida Venture Forum. And this is probably one of the most exciting episodes I think I've ever done just because what he does, he has his hand on the pulse of venture capitals, uh, angel investors, basically the people who have the money. And that's kind of exciting for me. So we're going to talk to Kevin. Kevin, how are you doing today? Good, Ray. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that great intro. I hope I can live up to the hype. I'm sure you can. I mean, you have such great information that I think every business owner spends most of their time trying to figure out when they first start. Um, that is the first question I hear I volunteer over at SCORE. And when we talk to new business owners, the very first question is funding. Where do I get money? And not necessarily that you have the means of funding people. You know, we've had that conversation before because you're, but your organization basically has the members that do the funding. And that's what we're talking about today. And, and, and you have a lot of insights in how funding happens. So let's dive right into some of the questions. So the first thing, you know, just tell us a little bit about what the Florida Venture Forum is uh, and, you know, and how you came about becoming the, the CEO of Florida Venture Forum. Sure. So the forum is a 40 year old member organization. It was founded in Miami in 1984. So this year we're celebrating uh, 40 years statewide organization and uh, we're a 501c6 member organization really focused on connecting growing companies with capital sources and other services that they need to grow and scale our members are venture investors as the name of the organization implies uh, ranging from very early seed to growth equity and in some cases um, later stage private equity and i know we'll We'll talk about what all that means uh, yep, probably absolutely. later. And then other professionals active in the innovation ecosystem, like attorneys, accountants, investment bankers, and other providers of business services that help companies grow and scale. They're critically important to the process as well. Absolutely. And, and yeah, well, I was going to say my first venture or my first uh, introduction into uh, the organization was I, I attended one of your panel discussions uh, where you had several venture capital firms um, or angel investment firms that were talking about the the climate of funding. And uh, it was actually a very, it was one of the most, I want to say one of the probably most interesting and intriguing panels I've ever been on, I've ever experienced. It was, uh, and, and what I loved about it is that you guys focused on founders the conversation was a lot about founders um, and helping founders. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Do you you know how how that whole process works? Yeah, so it's it's great that you picked up on that because I would say probably five years ago we we did a strategic planning um, process and we we've always been very focused on founders and and you know the forum over its forty years has put. Um, 2,500 companies on stage and created opportunities for them to present to um, different audiences as they try and raise capital. We, we realized that we hadn't done a great job of really putting founders at the center of the organization as kind of our reason for existing. And so we undertook a lot of, you know, kind of self-analysis and looked for ways to put our arms around the companies that are are really kind of 
um, pay, you know, blazing the trail in Florida, in our case, particularly venture backed companies that over the years, you know, we realized that the forum has um, a treasure trove of alumni, which we call them, you know, companies that have present, been selected to present at our conferences, um, you know, going back 20, 30 years. And we realized some of the biggest names in Florida, you know, big venture back success stories presented at our conference, not I mean, before I joined the organization, and then went on to become unicorns and create lots of value for the state, uh, hire lots of people and, you know, do all kinds of really great things, which, you know, venture capital in particular has a real multiplier effect. Um, a relatively small amount of venture capital placed into the right company can help that company accelerate and grow, you know, exponentially. And that's the whole business of venture capital, essentially. So we we really try in our everyday operations to be very founder focused. And um, a lot of the educational stuff we do, the panels like you were talking about, we try and demystify venture capital as much as we can, put, you know, actual VCs on panels so that people can meet them and, and what it is they're looking for, how best to approach them. Um, I know we're going to talk about this, but not every company is a venture capital target. Um, and it's good if companies know that there are lots of other types of capital that companies can avail themselves of. And then, you know, there's a whole school of thought that founders should focus on their businesses and try and grow organically if they can. Um, if they have the type of business that can grow without outside capital, um, you know, then great, more power to them. Um, not all businesses can do that. Yeah. What would you say? So you had talked about earlier how before you were there, um, and when you said that, it made me think, uh, you know, how did you get there? How did you get to the Florida Venture Forum? I'm I'm a Floridian. I grew up in, in Southwest Florida and went to UF undergrad. And then like a lot of kids i i left the state lived in new york and california worked in the um in the corporate world in the media and telecom industries um actually one of the few people who left florida to work for disney i moved to new york to work for disney oh wow that's worked, that's a first the <laughs> walt disney television um yeah for several years and and then i was i migrated from that to the telecom industry and that brought me back to florida i was working for a company that was building a global fiber optic network and I, we moved back to to florida um in the early 2000s and kind of during the internet boom of the late 90s, early 2000s, really a heady time. And then my boss at the at the company started a family, he retired, kind of semi-retired, and started a multifamily office. And when it was kind of my time to, to leave that company, I joined that multifamily office. And that's really how I was initially exposed to venture capital. They invested primarily in real estate, but did some tech investing. And through being with the family office, I became aware of the Florida Venture Forum and met a couple board members. And it just coincidentally, they were looking for a new um, leader of the organization. I threw my hat in the ring and was lucky enough to get it. It's the it's the best job I've ever had. I've been doing it for a little over 10 years. Um, I didn't plan to do it this long, but we have such a great membership and I work for a you know terrific board and we do kind of a happy thing every day, which is help companies grow. So it's, it's just a, you know, it's a really great organization and I'm a little biased, but uh, I, I think other people would say the same. Well, and the reason why I ask that question is because, you know, a lot of people like myself are huge uh, proponents of entrepreneurship and building businesses. And you have like the dream job. Like I, I really, uh, I, I, yeah, you know, it's one of those things that if you love entrepreneurship, that's where you want to be, you know, and uh, so that's why I asked that question, because it's I know a lot of people are looking uh, for opportunities like that. Like you you run into people that are like, I'd love to work at a venture capital firm. Or I'd love to work at angel investment, you know, place or whatever. But you are an organization that gets to speak to all of them and gets to work with all of them, which I think is actually pretty cool and, and a really great, great story, how you got there and everything. Tell me a little bit about venture capital. What is that? Yeah, so venture capital is a form of private equity. 
And private equity is basically money invested into privately owned, non-publicly traded companies. Um, and venture capital is a, a particular type of private equity that funds uh, startups and early stage and growth companies that tend to have very high potential and are fast growing companies. Um, the companies basically sell a part of themselves, uh, which is where the equity term comes in. And they use the VC's money to fuel their growth. Um, it's important to add that VCs don't just contribute money to a company. They also contribute contacts, expertise, um, other forms of guidance. So if you think of Shark Tank, for example, um, the companies that pitch on Shark Tank are not just getting Mark Cuban's money. They're also getting his expertise, his guidance. He's probably going to take a seat on their board and he's going to help them make connections. And then very importantly, um, VCs also help when it comes time for an exit or additional financing uh, because they have a vested interest, uh, an aligned interest with the company in making sure that the company grows and is successful um, in whatever its eventual uh, outcome is, whether it's a, a sale or additional financing or going public or whatever it may be. What you said is absolutely true. Like you have to invest like 10 companies and one of them will hopefully make enough money to kind of make up for all the money lost on the other ones. Right. So at that panel discussion, there was a company that was mentioned that I'm really close with um, and that was Fat Merchant. Um, oh yeah. You know, and Fat Merchant is a perfect example of that because Deep Work Capital actually, they, they were explaining how the, the amount of money they had made once they were able to cash out um, whether, and I don't think they cash out hundred percent, but I think the amount that they did cash out, they were able to make up for every single fund over years, every single company, like over a span of, I think they said like six or seven years that they had funded, they were able to make that and like five times more beyond that. Just wow. because yeah. the, um, because fat merchant who eventually uh, became stacks, um, had developed such a valuation and they were the, I think she said they were the first investor. Uh, when when Sunira, the founder, um, yep. had first started the company and was starting to get, uh, it was looking for funding. So um, I just thought that was that's a perfect example, of kind of what you just said. Like they, Deep Work Capital is one of those companies locally that that obviously invests, uh, does venture investing, and um, and that was the example they set. How that one company made up for all of the losses they've ever had with any company that didn't succeed. Yeah, that's exactly it. And it's uh, what a great story, uh, Fat Merchant. Um, Sunira presented at. One of our, I, I'm pretty sure she presented at one of our early stage conferences and actually met one of her early investors up through presenting at our conference. And um, what a great success story. Um, and I know she's going on to do, you know, I just saw a post she made on LinkedIn about, I think it was the 10 year anniversary of, of uh, Fat Merchant. And she was kind of, you know, going down memory lane a little bit, a great great entrepreneur and um and has really been very kind to um to give back to the forum come back and speak um a lot it's one of the really really cool things about founders is they as busy as they are they and you probably experienced this yourself like they're very if you give them the platform they're very willing to come back and share their story with other founders, even very early stage founders, you Absolutely. know, do things like this and, and come and speak at our conferences. And we've had some, been really lucky to have some very high profile founders who've been really successful come and speak. We had last year, we featured Brian Murphy from ReliaQuest in Tampa, Nice. Um, who who came and just was very generous with his time and gave great advice. We featured um, at one of our venture capital conferences, we invited um, Alberto Perlman, who's one of the founders of Zumba Fitness. Oh, wow. Okay. Not really a venture company, but the first question he asked when we asked him to come speak was, you know, are there, you know, I really like to only talk to founders, you know, are there going to be founders in the audience? And we we definitely found that. So it's it's really great when people have success and then kind of give back that way. We we you know we love that. You said not a venture. Uh, it was not a venture company. What do you mean by that? That's not a venture company. Yeah. So 
I mean, venture companies tend to be, I mean, in that particular case, I think Zumba at a later, at a later point in its evolution took some private equity money and, that, but that was mainly for, I think the, for the founders to, you know, to monetize some of their, some of their equity in the company. Venture, and that's, you're kind of getting to like, probably, probably what you mean by the question. We, we get a lot of times companies will apply for our, you know, to pitch at a, a forum event and they're, they're not really the type of company that would be of interest to a venture capital fund. Those tend to be companies, and it, it really is, pe people always say, oh, well, we're not a tech or a healthcare company, so VCs aren't going to be interested in us. And that's that can be true. There are exceptions to that. I think what, what venture capital fund for investors are really trying to find is growth, and, and they want to invest in a company a million dollars, five million dollars, something like that. In Florida, obviously, there are you know funds that invest a lot more than that, and some that invest less than that, hundreds of thousands. They want the company to take that money and scale quickly, you know, yeah. relatively quickly. So the company has to be at a certain point in its evolution to be able to to actualize that money and actually like create revenue, customers, etc., with that money. And then get to a point in their continuing evolution where there's some kind of strategic event that's going to um, that's going to allow the investor to to you know have a, a liquidity event to whether it's an ac an outright acquisition or another round um, of later stage capital or you know being acquired by going public so, you know there. Are, any number of, of outcomes. Usually the investor and the founder kind of have their eye on what that eventual path forward is. You know, like some companies are just kind of naturals to be acquired by a strategic investor, like some other big corporation. Some are gonna scale and go public. So some are just gonna keep growing and and you know the the founder the investors might just stay in, you know, after you know those those are the, you know, really nice ones where they can have a long run as as owners of the company. For the audience, I just want to clarify what you're talking about because it, it can be very complex um, as you go down the line of each round of funding. Uh, but essentially, you have they always tell you this: uh, friends, families, and fools, right? The first yep. people that usually invest are people that you know personally. Um, from there, what what is the next step? Is it the angel investor would be the next step after friends, Good. family, and fools, or? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, an angel investor, which it, you know, is typically a, someone who, who, you know, it could, could be a individual, there are angel funds as well, mm -hmm. um, where they make very early investments in companies. They typically will know the industry in some way and be able to not only contribute their money, but also contribute connections, expertise. Absolutely. And help the, help the founder and the founding team grow the company. So this is also roughly at the same level of seed capital, which can also be angel capital. Um, yeah, explain that. Explain the seed capital. Why, why is it called seed capital? Well, I think it probably goes to like, you know, seed of growing a plant, you know. As, I mean, seed capital is, can. there are no hard black and white lines here. People can call themselves angels and they invest in seed rounds. They're, those tend to be kind of the early rounds of, institutional capital. So the first capital other than your uncle Joe or, you know, Aunt Jenny, you know, who give, just gives you the money because they love you and they believe in you. You know, these are people who've really value they're, you know, either professional investors or it's it's a, a sideline for them in the case of a lot of angels. They invest very early and they will often, you know, we have most of the major angel groups are in the membership of the forum. And they're, and and also venture funds will do early, very early stage investing as well. Not all of them, but some. And then they will then typically help the company get to the next round of funding, which will more than likely be kind of venture level funding, which tends to be just a bigger check. And and then it just kind of goes from there. And there are series A, B, C, and you know beyond in terms of rounds of capital that a company will 
will take. And when people get to that series A, B, at that point, are they revenue generating at that point? Or is it still kind of, or they, it can just be an idea still at that point? What, what they, do you think? They will almost always be revenue generating. They might okay. not be profitable, but they'll be revenue generating. And in fact, I mean, revenue is, I mean, even earlier stage companies um, will quite often be revenue generating, even most of the time. It really is just, a, it depends. I mean, revenue is at that stage is is a is an indicator of market acceptance. Think of it that way. The investors love seeing, they want to see revenue, but they, they, and certainly want, they like revenue for the dollars, but they also like revenue because it's an indicator, as I said, of market acceptance. Companies can also, you know, quite often there, if a company's got like a, a platform or something like that, users can be another indicator of market acceptance. So, a company might have a low amount of revenue, but a really great, you know, hockey stick user adoption and user acceptance and user user um, utilization metrics that investors will find really exciting. And, you know, if you think of the early days of Facebook, you know, if, if you're old enough to have read read that story, you know, and seen the movie back in the, I guess that was like the late, 2003 thousands yeah um and in the movie it's it, there's a kind of famous battle between selling advertising and making money versus getting users absolutely and zuckerberg famously was like well we got we'll have time to like monetize later right now we have to capture market share and get users on the platform yeah and in that case that was enough for venture investors they they saw wow you know you've gone from I'm pulling numbers out of the air. Like you've gone from a thousand users last month to 10,000 this month and your growth trajectory, you'll, you'll have a million at the end of the year. That's really appealing, um, especially yeah. in a in a nascent industry where you're grabbing market share. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I actually have firsthand experience um, in, in a startup that was like that. There's a company uh, right here in Orlando called Got Chosen. And yeah. I was one of the first developers, uh, one of the early developers that started building that platform. Uh, and I came in as a as a back end developer and then a team lead, but my I answered directly to the CEO and I got to watch how we were evaluating the value of the company based on user base. Um, we had a million users in our database, but they weren't part of our platform. Um, but the day we switched on the platform in beta and moved those users to the platform itself, the social media platform, we enticed those users to start using the platform. Um, the CEO was starting to started to use that as the determining factor of the valuation of the company when he was seeking the next round of funding um, or even seeking interest from other companies. Like we had career builder that was interested in uh, potentially investing or acquiring the platform. So like I said, firsthand knowledge, like what you just said, it's, it's totally true. The amount of users, there's a calculation that goes into how much I can earn per user at some point. And that kind of helps determine that valuation. Do you see that? Have you seen that too as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is definitely one of the, I mean, valuation is a, is a art and a science and that that's a whole topic unto itself. Um, but you, you know, user adoption, user utilization and just growth rate, it all goes back to kind of growth and, and market share. Um, those are all like really, really important metrics and can, I mean, rev again, revenue is, is important. And back to your original question, I mean, one of the metrics we use at, when we um, select companies to present at, at our conferences is where are they in revenue? And again, it's mainly because it's mainly because that is an indicator of traction and market adoption and how, you know, and what the opportunity is, um, you know, if you're, if you've got a million users and you're just starting to monetize, that means you've got a lot of upside, which so sounds like, you know, the example you cited. So yeah. investor, venture investors love those kinds of stories. And that's, that's what they're, that's what they're seeking. So I know a question that's going to, that's probably going to be on some people's minds, especially if anyone tries, does research on venture capital investing, Amazon everyone knows who's ever followed Amazon over the span of the life of that company knows that they had lost millions and millions of dollars year after year, over year, over year, but they kept getting more investment. Investors kept pouring money into that company. 
from your personal experience and knowledge, what was it that they were seeing that the general public is going, how can you put money into a company that's constantly losing money? You know, what, what would, what would you say was the kind of thought process behind that? I don't know a lot about the, the early days of Amazon in particular. I, I do remember another one, which was now is ubiquitous, but there was a period where it was really tough going, which is Netflix, you know, Netflix mm -hmm. in the early days had you know, an uncertain future and, and, you know, it's it's really an, another interesting story. I think again, it probably goes back. I mean, the case of Amazon, it was. I'm old enough to remember when Amazon started. Your younger, our younger uh, viewers will not remember this, but they started selling books. It was books only at, at initially, and I think the idea was that books were because of the way the postage rates work with printed material. They were cheaper to ship. And they were easier to ship and it, you know, just allowed kind of Jeff Bezos and the early team to be very focused. And then they kind of built the platform and proved out the model and then started adding product categories. So then I think they migrated in, if I remember correctly, into like electronics and other things. And then, you know, obviously became what it is today. But that was probably a case of like also capturing market share and showing, proving out the concept. Obviously I wasn't in the room, but I yeah. can only imagine like the pitch was probably like, okay, here's our growth rate selling, you know, books and this second category. And we added this other category and immediately the growth rate got even better. And so the number of product categories that we can add is almost infinite. To eventually, I can, I'm imagining that this is probably what happened. They probably said, eventually you'll be able to just, we'll have warehouses everywhere and you'll be able to just buy your groceries and we'll be able to deliver them to you overnight. And people probably 20 years ago said, that's crazy, but you know, it wouldn't surprise me if that was the original vision. I just wanted to ask that question because I mean, it, it was, it's just one of those questions, I think. And Netflix was a good, a good example. If you've yeah. read his book or, or read the book on Netflix and everything, it's the same kind of example. It's a company that's not making money, but people are just throwing money at it, knowing that there's like a, or not knowing, but you know what I mean? Assuming that it's going to get to a certain level and they're going to be able to cash out. You mentioned this in the process, by the way, when you're mentioning the process of investors at some point, they have to liquidate their investment, right? I usually have this conversation with people who are looking to start a new business and they're always wondering when do they, when does that get liquidated? So, so I figured I'd ask you because you would know better than I would. So when, what are the different ways that an investor liquidates their investment into a business, especially if they're investing in like, let's say my business, how do I know, how, how can I expect them to get liquidated from, from their investments? Well, sometimes it's a subsequent round. Like, so a, a later round of capital can take out in early investors at a new value, a high, hopefully higher valuation. So they, they, you know, have a great exit, it's called. Sometimes it's an acquisition, an outright acquisition where um, the company will sell itself to a bigger company or go public or, you know, have some other type of liquidity event where there's basically a new set of owners or a new owner if it's if it's just one entity buying the company and it um all the people that are on the what's called the cap table of the company get kind of monetized so if you own you know uh one percent of the company and when you bought in that one percent you know you paid a hundred thousand for that one percent um and the new valuation of the company is some something significantly greater, your 1% is going to be worth a lot more and someone is going to pay at a new valuation, a much higher price, and you're going to do very well on your exam, you know, your investment. So imagine going back to Amazon, if you, in the very early days, if you had bought 1% of Amazon, a, a normal investor might have been able to do that. Um, today, that would take billions of dollars, right? To to own one percent of Amazon, so yeah, that's that's the uh, that's kind of what everyone hopes for, and and you know that a lot of times exits are also driven by the the structure of a fund. So different funds have different th 
thesis for investing. So some of them, the thesis can be by stage, like we only invest in early stage and here's our definition of early stage, or we only invest in growth stage and here's our definition of growth stage. Or it could be by industry. We only invest in software companies or we only invest in healthcare companies. And the limited partners in that fund will choose to invest in that fund based on that thesis because they themselves are trying to create diversity of, you know, picture, for example, like an endowment or some, you know, that's placing money in different funds. Well, they wouldn't want to be limited partners in 20 funds that were all doing the same thing. They'd want to diversify. So they'd yeah. want to have some exposure to the early stage, to growth stage, to women-owned companies, to sustainable companies, to, um, you know, a, a specialty fund that's just investing in clean tech or, you know, whatever. And they'd have a very diversified, they diversify their money that they put out into the market and they have a time horizon. So funds will often, you know, say, you know, our goal is to invest and find an exit within a finite period of time. And so that it, it really can run the gamut, but that's what drives a lot of times the exit period. As a business owner, if I'm sitting there and I'm listening to you, what you just laid out for us is very similar to like demographic uh, information that you, when you, if I'm going to look for a customer, there's certain qualities of that customer that I need for them to be a customer of mine, right? To fit, to fit the product market fit, so to speak, right? And in this case, that's what you just mentioned. It's kind of like, I need to have a product market fit of what investor am I going after? What's, you know, what kind of industry, like you said, what are the de general terms and conditions they're looking for? Um, how would a business owner get that information, find that information? How do they research to get, to be able to find who those people are? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we try and be a resource for that here in Florida. Um, uh, we we have a, a website called flinnovationconnect.org, which is um, it's kind of an eco map of the innovation ecosystem in Florida, and we have a list of investors on there. You can you know the other way to do it is just kind of come to events like ours, and there there are organizations all over the state that that help um, founders identify potential investors. It's really important. And I, investors talk about this a lot, which is for a founder to be very specific about finding the most likely investors for them. So what what doesn't make any sense and what's a real waste of time is for you're running a software company and you spend a lot of time sending out emails and inquiries to venture funds that only invest in healthcare. Like that's a waste of your time. It's a waste of their time. Or you're looking for, you know, half a million dollars of seed capital and they only, they like, the fund likes to write 5 million plus checks. You're just not going to be a match. I mean, if you get a warm intro to somebody and they're willing to like talk to you and give you some advice, great. They may connect you with someone they know. Warm introductions are terrific. But if you're, if you're doing your research, you want to try and find the investors that are the most likely to invest in you and what you're doing. And it just, there's no shortcut to it. You just have to do the research. The good yeah. thing is most venture funds um, have websites and they literally put on their websites what, what their investment criteria is, what their thesis is, what they invest in. And more often than not, they literally, they actually will, you can submit a inquiry to them, um, a, yeah. you know, an executive summary and a, a, your deck and they'll take a look. I mean, they, I know they do look at, um, at those, you know, they typically have associates or, you know, analysts who will look at what comes over the transom. And that is, um, that is, that does, that is how investments happen. Quite yeah. often, you know, it definitely happens. I definitely, I, I definitely want to second what you said about physically going to a conference. Uh, your Florida, the early venture conference you guys just held recently. I mean, that was an amazing conference. I, I went uh, and I got to meet so many people, so many uh, inv potential investors that I would never have met. Like I would never know who they are or what they do unless, like you said, unless I went online, did the research, try to find them. But the best part about it, I was able to talk to them and just listen to what exactly they're looking for, the type of companies they, they're trying to invest in. Um, and then you had like a sit down area where you could just sit down with them and chat. I mean, 
conferences are the are one of the best things. It was probably one of the best, like I said, one of the best conferences I've been at. You know, the the, the early venture one, and I love the format. And this is just me, <laughs> just uh, enjoying. You know what I had, what I experienced was um, you, when you guys did the pitch rounds, the the pitch yeah. sessions. It was amazing because you're sitting in a large room and all of that of them are sitting there too. They're listening to the pitches, and you may be sitting next to a a, a venture capital you know person that's uh, looking at a potential company that's pitching. Um, but you're also listening and seeing how companies pitch. The format was amazing. The video intro, then the sit down fireside chat, you know, um, stuff like that. So it's just the experience is, is important. So any business owner out there just experience something like that, because then you'll get a knack for what people are looking for. You'll also get a knack for how you need to prepare as a company for those specific events. Um, cause I, you know, our, certain companies that we look into, we don't invest, but we're a software engineering company and we consult. And so sometimes we get people that are like, we'd love for you to jump in on equity. And so we do the same thing like an investor would, we have to analyze them as a business. And if like none of those companies had like a video intro, <laughs> like the, some of these intros explain what the company does in a very short format. And then now you can just ask questions off that video. And I think that was like one of the perfect formats for that. So well, that's kudos great. That's that. no. Appreciate that feedback. We we used to do more of a, you know, short PowerPoint and a, kind of a one way. Um, the founder would get up on stage and you know either stand behind the podium or walk around and give a PowerPoint presentation. And you know when you're when you we, we select 20, 30, 40, 50 companies and you're it just gets it's it can be unpleasant for the audience uh, and for the founder, frankly, to do that kind of presentation. And so we, a few years ago, we changed it to what you're describing, where there's kind of a short intro. Video. All the information about the company is in the event app. I mean, if you really want to like read, see their deck and or read their executive summary, you've got it. But we wanted to make it more free form. So there's a short intro video. Then the company sits down with a real venture investor from our membership, typically, who has educated themselves on the company. They understand, you know, what their business is. And it's it's kind of like, I call it, we call it like a a positive shark tank. There's no gotcha. Yes. Like the, 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 the interviewer is really trying to help the company tell the best story possible. Yes. Not, not. BSing, but trying to like put their best face forward and genuinely having a conversation about the company, which if you're a founder is so much better because you're, yeah. you're able to like, you know, having a conversation is so much better than a one way, um, yeah. just PowerPoint presentation, it's so much more watchable. So it's, it's one of the best innovations we've made. So thank, thanks for that feedback. It just makes it for the audience so much better. Yeah, I was going to add to that because there was a company that, you know, that, like, you guys still ask the hard question, but it, what you're right, it was a positive way of asking that question. Yeah. There was a company that had demonstrated, essentially they were using the term AI and because everyone says AI, if you just throw AI out there, people are going to invest right. in your company. And um, I forgot who was the panelist that the, the or the person that was interviewing. They dug deeper into what the company was actually doing. And at the end of the day, what it was is they were using a front interface to essentially get the business but then there's people in the background actually doing the work and really there wasn't ai yet it's being built but it wasn't there yet so that was you know for if i was like an investor i'm like i'd be like thank you <laughs> thank you because i didn't i thought they had ai and i was about to invest in ai but it, there is no ai yet and it was just great but it wasn't a negative way it was very positive allowed the the the, the founder to kind of explain what they're doing and so you can sit there and say, okay, right now they're probably not investable, but maybe six months down the road they may be, you know, um, yeah. and it will give you the opportunity to actually see them. And, and yeah, so that was, that was, that's a great, uh, that was one of the moments that I remember very cleanly. Like if this was a shark tank, you'd be like, oh, you have no business. Why are you here? You know, but you guys didn't do that. You continue yeah. to ask to say, oh, okay, so you're working on this and you're trying to establish this. So I thought that was really great. And, and mm -hmm. also you guys. Uh, brought in education, like a, a lot of people were from education institutions, students who had concepts and ideas that you guys gave them the floor uh, to show their ideas, which how many investment groups actually do that? I mean, I, I think that that's a, I thought that was a really great thing that you guys did uh, at that event. So, oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, you you touched on a couple 
really good points I want to come back to, which are one, that format also allows people to see VCs in action, to see them actually asking questions of a founder and having a conversation and learning from the type of questions that a, that a real live VC will, would ask, which is the point you made. It If you're a very early stage founder, seeing another founder up on stage talking about their company can be very informative for you, particularly if it's someone who's a little farther along and has had success. You can, it you know, you can really learn a lot. And so that's why we, one of the other things we, we do at all of our conferences is we have a founder rate that's, I mean, we recognize our, our, we do two big conferences a year, the Florida Venture Capital Conference, which is coming up in March of 2025 in Miami. And then we do an earlier stage conference, which is the one you're talking about. They're not cheap tickets. I mean, the, you know, it's hundreds of dollars to come to our conference. And we, but we try and make it accessible for founders. Some, some entrepreneur facing organizations have a business model that frankly relies on charging founders money. And we try not to do that. Like we, we try and yeah, make it yeah. very, if you're selected to present at one of our events, there's no charge. We don't, the forum doesn't take any ownership. You literally don't, the founder who comes to present doesn't pay a penny. That's awesome. And even if you're not selected or you didn't even apply, you can get a founder rate to attend our conference. And for, really for the reason that you just talked about or we're talking about, which is for the education part of it. Um, and rubbing elbows with VCs and, and other professionals, you know, it's not just give a quick shout out to, you know, our other members, lawyers, accountants, investment bankers. These are very, very important people in the innovation ecosystem and in the venture ecosystem. Even VCs rely a lot on those professionals for deal referral, um, and how a company should kind of proceed and put their best face forward and approach investors. Um, so I always tell any founder that I talk to, like, get the best advisors you can as early as you can set up your business from day one so that you have the proper, you know, accounting practices, your books are in order, you've protected your IP, you know, your, your cap table is clean and, you know, so that if at some point in the future you you do get an investment from a venture fund, there's no, you know, ticking time bombs that are going to wait a sec. Wh where are your financials for the past three years that you've been in business? Oh, you know, we didn't we didn't do them or they're in a shoebox. <laughs> you, your uncle Fred gave you, uh, you know, one hundred thousand dollars to start the business. Do you have an agreement with him? Oh, you know, we we never did that. Well, Guess what? Uncle Fred is going to want his money back. <laughs> doing doing that from a very early point and and getting good advisement is is really really important if you're serious about growing a company. And that leads me to my next question. Actually, that's a great segue. The type of founders, like the type of founders that you think, or from your experience, or even from the group as you've worked with them, what are the kind of attributes that they're looking for in a founder? Yeah. So there's a so the there's an old saying or a saying that you'll hear, um, which is VCs invest in the jockey, not the horse. So that's one thing, like successful founders are just good. The founder is critically important. Like, and a lot of times I, and I've heard, seen this and heard this people, investors will say, I don't love this business, but I love the founder and they, you know, you know, cause you're an entrepreneur, like not everything people do works. Um, but maybe the next thing's going to work. And we, you were talking earlier about, you know, Sunira from fat merchant, like, I'm sure you'll agree with me. I don't care what she does. I'm, I want to look at it. Right. Because yeah. she's going to be very, she's just the type of person who's going to be successful. And that, that is really, really important. So back to the qualities, I mean, you, you know, there's, a book, uh, everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Like it, it really, I mean, you gotta be smart. You've got to work hard. You've, but you also have to be honest. 
You have to be coachable. That's another really, really big one. I've seen it firsthand. We form investor-only selection committees to evaluate the companies that apply to present at our conferences. And, you know, there are times when people will apply and I will hear people, hear investors say, like, I kind of like what they're doing, but this guy or gal is just not coachable. They think they know everything. And th this brings me to a point that we haven't covered, which is really important. Investors, venture investors in particular, they don't just want to invest money. And if you're a founder, you don't, you don't want just money. You want, you're, you're also getting advice, wisdom, brains, contacts. So, you know, think about if you're a founder and you've got two investment offers, one of them is from somebody that, you know, you kind of like, but they don't know much about your industry or your business. And the other one, you really vibe with them and they've invent, they know your space really well. Who are you going to choose? I mean, you're going to choose the one that knows your industry and can help you with you. They're going to probably going to take a seat on your board. So you're going to want their advice, their counsel, their contacts, and, and they're going to want to give it to you. Um, so that's really, really important. Um, so it just, it, I've seen it so many times, like you just, you know, um, good founders are good people and good human beings. They're driven, they work hard. They have to be all those things too. They have to be, have leadership qualities and all the things that y you, you would, you would think of, but they're also people you want to be around every day and be in business with. That's one of the things that I feel like when I talk to entrepreneurs in general, and they're looking for uh, funding, like I have this one client that she's been looking for funding for a while. There's people that she resonates with very, very well. They understand her industry. Um, they may not be able to invest the same as this other organization that could give them more money, but has, doesn't have contacts. Doesn't have like it's, it's, and you could just tell there's already friction in the conversation. And, and I'm trying to convince her you're going to be working with these people every day, basically. Yeah. So you need to like them and they need to be able to like you and you need to be able to trust them. That's a huge thing. They need to be able to trust each other. Um, but that's, so that's a, you know, like you said, that, that is probably one of the, the biggest things. Have you ever come across, you, you said it earlier and I, and I was interested. I wanted to know if you can give me an example of, you don't have to say the name, but do you know of any, any founder that kind of came off as arrogant or like you kind of looked at them and said, this, this might be a good business, but man, this, this person, I just don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to work with this person. <laughs> there, there, there have been a few, um, you know, and it, it just, it's better to be, you know, be, be really focused on your business, know your, know your stuff. You have to have a clear vision, but it, it really is important to, you know, just be, be a good, a good person. And you, you said it like, you know, you're going to be in business with these people and it, we've had a couple members have said this on panels, like over the years that it, when a VC invests in your company, it's, you're kind of stuck together. Like it's, it's easier to get divorced. It's, it's literally more enduring than a marriage, than a marriage, at least for a period of time. So, you know, and, and it, it just, it just makes life a lot more pleasant because the other thing, it, it kind of a good segue to this too, if you're a founder and you're thinking about taking outside capital, you really want to be very conscious of how that's going to change your life. You know, if you're a founder and you're hundred percent owner of your company, you're the boss. I mean, you make, you make all the decisions, you do everything on your own. If you take someone else's money and they buy equity in your company, even if they just buy 1%, 2%, 5%, they're probably going to be on your board. You're going to, in a way, you're going to, you're definitely going to be in business together. And in a way you're going to work for them. You know, yeah. they're probably not punching, you know, you're probably not punching a time clock, but you're, you're definitely reporting. There's a reporting structure when you have a board and, and, you know, so it, it's going to change your life and you should be aware of that and make sure that that's your, that you're, Okay with that. It's an important distinction because that's the, I, I would consider that being um, one of the misconceptions. We were talking about misconceptions of, uh, of raising capital. And I think one of the misconceptions that people do have is 
if I rate like they're they're not a decision maker in my company. They're gonna give us money and you know, but they're not gonna be a decision maker. So therefore I could do whatever I can I, I want to do with the money and I don't have to answer anybody and yada yada yada. And the reality is like I said, uh, you gotta answer to somebody because it ain't it ain't all your money. So Very someone true. put it's a, yeah. you know, it's like it's like anything else. If you put money into if you invested in somebody, you'd want to know where your money's going and how it's yeah. being spent and, and how you're going to get the return. So uh, it's a very similar situation. But you're you're also, if you have a, if you have a great board, you have a treasure trove of, of wisdom and contacts and, you know, potential, you know, if you, if you assemble your board correctly, um, it's, it's just really, really valuable and can help the business get, you know, get, can be in, in critical to getting the business to the next step. At the conference that you were talking about, we featured um, a woman named Anya Freeman, who's running a company called Kind Design in South Florida, which is making 3D printed seawalls and and um, really kind of addressing uh, climate change and sea level rise and uh, really interesting company. But Anya was, I don't know if you saw her speak, uh, she spoke at the lunch, but she, um, she just talked a lot about you know how much she re how much she relies on her board and how invaluable they have been to helping the company grow bringing in other investors making contacts for major customer wins and things like that it's just really really critically important and even if you're not taking capital another piece of advice for any founder form an advisory board even even if it's an informal one you know Many years ago, when I was with the family office, I got involved in a, we were looking to make an acquisition uh, in a really arcane it, part of the marine industry, in the, a manufacturing end of the marine industry. And w no one knew anything about manufacturing. And we found a retired, really rich guy, frankly, over in Naples who had been in manufacturing. I think he was referred by a lawyer or something, but he, he basically kind of joined an advisory group helping us evaluate this acquisition and was going to put his own money in as part of it. And we just learned so much about manufacturing from this this guy. And he was so generous with his his wisdom and his time and he was going to put his money in, too. But, you know, whatever business you're in, that's one of the great strengths we have in Florida, by the way, is think about think about the wisdom and the experience that's sitting in, you know, your average retirement community, you know, um, if so, if you're if you're starting a company in whatever, you know, the insurance industry, whatever, do some research and find find people who've been really successful in that industry. They're probably sitting in Naples or West Palm or or Orlando or wherever you know, playing golf and or fishing or, you know, kind of enjoying retirement, but you never know. I mean, if nothing else, they could be a mentor and, um, you know, but if you, if you can cultivate the relationship, maybe they can, you know, refer clients or refer a potential investor or, you know, it's it just, it's a, it's a resource we have here. And um, I, I think, we don't take enough advantage of it uh, in Florida. Absolutely. You actually uh, helped me segue to the next question. <laughs> so um, wh where do you see the landscape of Florida investment in the next five years? I'm really bullish um, on our state. It's, you know, what's happened in Florida. I mean, Florida has always been a, a pro-business entrepreneurial state. It's probably just the nature of, of Florida, of, you know, carving a civilization out of ranch and swampland. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, it just, and the state is all about growth. Um, it's also one of our biggest challenges, right? So in, in terms of venture, I mean, the past few years have been really, really great for venture capital in Florida. We still don't get, you know, our, uh, there's room to grow, of course. Um, but, you know, all the all the, it's fertile ground. I mean, there are a lot of really serious players in venture who have moved here. And because of the notoriety that Florida has achieved over the past few years in particular, the other thing that's happened is 
maybe five or 10 years ago, a Silicon Valley venture fund might not be covering Florida. Mm -hmm. But now I think every fund in America that invests, you know, uh, anywhere in the country has somebody covering Florida. It's one of the reasons why, frankly, our the Florida Venture Capital Conference has doubled in size in the past three years because there yes. are, you know, we're setting records for out of state and first time attendance because you know, venture funds in Boston and New York and Chicago and California are saying, you know, hey, I keep hearing about all this stuff that's happening in Florida. You know, we got to check this out. That's that's great for us. You know, we want more venture capital and founders, you know, moving to the state as well. It's a great, I mean, obviously yeah. no state income tax, nice weather. It's a, it's a great, you know, pro-business climate and all of our major metro areas have. <clears throat> the other thing that's happened is the entrepreneur support infrastructure has grown, you know, in, in my time with the forum has grown tremendously you know, not just on the funding side, but on the mentoring side as well. So every one of our universities has an a, a entrepreneur center where, you know, in most cases, even anybody from the community can can go there and get advisement. You mentioned SCORE. There's, um, you know, organizations all over the state in every market that, that you know, form cohorts and help uh, help founders kind of package their, you know, their uh, work on their business plan and package their company to put their best face forward to investors. And so all of that is relatively new in the state so yeah. within the past five to 10 years. I can attest to that. Last week I sat in a, uh, I represented SCORE in a roundtable discussion with a congressman for government contracting for small businesses. I did last week, I sat in this round table and it was amazing the amount of resources and efforts that are being put towards helping small businesses, uh, helping entrepreneurs, founders, uh, like you said, not only build out business plans, but learn how to pitch uh, and not just in tech markets, but also how to pitch to government. Um, and things like that. I mean, even in your, even in the, uh, the, the early venture conference, you guys had a whole space section and, um, we've actually done, we've actually met with several of those companies that were in your, uh, in your, on the section where they were pitching a lot of space ideas and thoughts and so, and we, and the amazing part is we were able to see a lot of potential partnerships from those groups. I mean, just one company was a satellite company and the two other companies that went after him were things that could be attached to the first guy satellite company. So, so we, so we were, so we were able to meet with some of those and say, Hey, you know, that you could work with you. Like you, you could work with this guy, this guy could work with that guy. And you guys could all kind of form one big partnership here. So, um, so like I said, there's a lot being invested. That has happened at the forum where we've selected companies and the founders met at our event. And then eventually they do something together. Uh, that has happened as well. So, yeah, there's going to be an announcement coming soon where we're involved in it, where we're going to be working with some of those satellite companies in the in the oh, near cool. future. So that's great, uh, which I was excited about. Yeah, and I owe it all to your conference. If I did, if I didn't attend that conference, I would never have met these people. So it was actually pretty awesome. Yeah, it's interesting in this. You know, here we are talking over, you know, a, a virtual platform. But and during COVID, I mean, we did our conferences virtually, and they they came off great. Um, but you know, there's just something about in-person events that I don't, I don't know. We we're doing, I mean, I think we're all probably doing less traveling and it's a lasting effect of COVID. Uh, you know, you, you do, we do more over zoom and uh, virtual platforms, but in terms of events and seeing companies pitch and really sitting down and talking, networking, it's very hard to do. It's very hard to replace in person. Uh, I definitely wanted to touch on a couple things uh, before we go. One of them is, uh, first of all, for any small business listening, uh, any entrepreneur listening founder, what are, what are some ways they could take advantage of the Florida Venture Forum uh, and get involved? Yeah, great question. I so first I mentioned FL Innovation Connect, which is um, it's a it's an it's 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 an eco map of the Florida innovation ecosystem. So a lot of other, or we, we stood it up and populated it, but it's everyone's 
website, not ours. And there are all kinds of uh, resources on there. Most entrepreneur facing organizations in the state have a presence there so you can learn about them. Um, so I recommend that for sure. And then no matter where you are in the state, I mean, you certainly come to our events. Um, the Florida Venture Capital Conference is March 3rd through 5th in Miami. We haven't announced the early stage uh, date yet, but it'll be sometime in second quarter, spring, <clears throat> following the VC conference. And as I mentioned, we, we have really, you know, we try and make it as easy as possible for founders to attend, um, you know, financially. And, um, you know, we you can learn a lot by coming. Yeah. But no matter where you are, I would, you, and you'll find these resources on FL Innovation Connect. As I mentioned before, every one of our great universities has an entrepreneur center. There's SCORE, there's TAI. I, I don't want to start naming organizations because I'll leave <laughs> some so many of partners them. of ours and I'll leave somebody yeah. off. But, but if you do I have was, a newsletter. I do, I do want to mention, you do have a yes, newsletter. And, yes. and you could subscribe to, um, we do a weekly, it's a venture report. Um, on fundings and events that are taking place. Um, comes out every Monday morning. It's free. You can go to our website, flventure.org, and subscribe. And that lists all of the major venture events that are, or and innovation and entrepreneurship events that are taking place really anywhere in the state. And I would just, yeah, you just got to get out there. And there are lots of lo lots and lots of, of great organizations in every market in the, in the state that, where founders can go, even if you're not, no matter what your company does, where you can go and get advisement and counseling and, and help with your business plan. And, you know, I really recommend it because they're really, they're great people and they're, you know, they're really trying to make the tide rise um, in their local communities. We'll have all of that information in the show notes so that people can link uh, out to it, everything from the newsletter to your website, uh, and then also the other resources that you mentioned. We'll put all that in the show notes for people to be able to click on it and go to those things. So any last parting words before we go? Any last final thoughts? Boy, I think we've covered a lot. I just, you know, hope to see um, everybody at one of our events. Um, of course, you know, we, we, we hope you support the Florida Venture Forum. But, you know, again, wherever you are, and one of the great things about my job is I get to travel around the state and most of these organizations are partners of, of the forum. There is just no reason why you need to go it alone. Just reach out. If you're in Orlando, UCF has great resources, USF, UF, uh, UNF, every one of our university, they tend to kind of congregate around the universities, but there are also terrific yeah. entrepreneur facing organizations in every one of our communities around Florida. Um, and again, go to flinnovationconnect.org and you can find those um, in your area. And uh, yeah, I wish everyone the best. We Entrepreneurs are, are our heroes. So if you're out there, you know, starting a company, you are, you're on the front line and we, we applaud you. So probably a good, good way to sign off. There you go. Hey, Kevin, I appreciate the time. Uh, definitely uh, everyone watching, um, uh, go to uh, obviously like, like, subscribe, click all the buttons so you can get all this information. Uh, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next podcast. And Kevin, again, I really appreciate you being here. A lot of information. I really would love to get you back and do a deep dive. Um, probably confuse a lot of people, but uh, I think we can make it work. So, but right. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ray.